Think of a moment when someone that you least expected to see suddenly stands before you. A moment when something you'd lost is found again and you can scarcely believe your eyes. Think of a moment when, you fear, when your fear was suddenly proved unfounded and you were surprised by joy. This morning is such a moment. We resign ourselves to the worst and suddenly life turns around. So come this Easter morning to be shaken from your conviction that nothing can change your situation. Come if you look at the world and feel overwhelmed by its chaos or dis disillusioned by its promises. On this morning, we remember how Jesus' followers threw, thought that their leader was destroyed, feared that their movement was ended, and instead, they found hope that the risen one was guiding them to something even more momentous. Come to worship, prepared to see your life and the world through new eyes. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Good morning and happy Easter. My name is Tom O'Brien, and I am blessed to serve Memorial Congregational Church as pastor and teacher. This morning and every day, we welcome all on a journey of acceptance, connection, meaning, and purpose. We give a special welcome to everyone who is here in the sanctuary and to those joining us online at home. Know that no matter who you are, no matter where you are physically, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we join our voices together. We make a holy and mighty noise together with all of these wonderful musicians and instruments that we have today. And I invite you now to turn to uh, hymn number 216 in the black uh, blue chalice hymnals that are in your pews, and we will sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today, and I invite you to rise as you are comfortable doing so. <laughs> Thank you. 
risen. Good morning and happy Easter. My name is Christine Vandewiggy, and as your student minister, I'm honored to be with you on this holiest of holy days. Would you please join me now in the spirit of prayer? God of light and love, today is your game changer. Easter changes everything. Easter reminds us that Jesus is more than just a kind-hearted philosopher, more than just a wise teacher. Easter is what makes Jesus the Christ, the Word made flesh who was God and was with God since the beginning of time in the beautiful triune dance of Creator, Son, and Spirit. On Easter, you, dearest Lord, resurrected Jesus to be the Christ, our blessed Savior. You gave us Easter, and when Jesus gave his life on the cross, the punishment for our sins ended. You gave us Easter, and from Christ's resurrection, our hope in eternal life springs forth. Christ is risen, and we come to you in gratitude for the renewal birthed in us by your Spirit, our Redeemer. Amen. Now is the time when we come together as a congregation, a community of God, to speak the covenant of Memorial Congregational Church printed in your bulletin. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of humanity. And as the Lord's free people, we agree to walk together in all God's ways made known or to be made known to us. You may be seated. Now, can I have the chance?
children, come and join me up front for the children's time. <laughs> hello, hello. Come on down. Come on down. You could bring a parent if you want. Parents are allowed. That, well, we're all children of God, so, you know, we could even have adults come. Uh, can you uh, open up a little bit so that uh, the, 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 the last ones can be included? That was kind of a Jesus thing. I think I learned this somewhere. So I brought something. Now, when you think of Easter, I suspect you all think of Easter baskets. Did any of you get Easter baskets? Yeah? Mm hmm. Uh, they're usually not filled with running shoes, are they? No. Now, tomorrow is a, is a special day in Boston. Does anybody know what tomorrow is in Boston? Yeah. It's the marathon. Tomorrow is Marathon Monday. And um, you might think that Marathon Monday has nothing to do with Easter, right? Did you know an important part of the Easter story is running? There was, a, there was even a race on the first Easter. Yeah, I know. You didn't know that, did you? Okay, so I need some help with this. Um, I brought, I, I brought some running shoes. Now, these running shoes came from Melissa Stolper, and she told me they actually ran in the Hartford Marathon. So um, uh, would, would you two uh, each like to take, a, take one of them? I, I, they're, they're props, and I'm going to need some help with this. Now, these came from um, Dan Rippey, and he is an avid runner who has run many marathons. These look pretty new, so I think they're probably just beginning their running career. Those have been retired to gardening, I've been told. So um, would, would you guys like to each take, you know, maybe you could share one. You, you can come get them. I'm not going to toss them. I don't toss well. And then, we have these shoes, and these were from my neighbor. And my neighbor is pretty old and, and used to be an avid runner and um, did run in these. Now he mostly uses them for walking. So could a couple of you guys, yeah, um, Micah, come get one and, and hand one to, to somebody else over there. Find, a, find another willing partner. I need help with this. One of you Morrissey kids will come through. I have faith in you. So, I'm going to tell you a story that involves Easter and running. So, it was the first Easter. It was Sunday. And uh, one of Jesus' students and very closest friends, Mary Magdalene, was really, really, really sad. Because Jesus had died. And all she could think about was... He had told her everything was going to be better. Everything was going to be different. And he kept telling her how much God loved the world. And she had come to really depend on him. And now he was dead. And she didn't know what was going to happen. So she walked very slowly to the garden where Jesus' body had been buried in a cave. And when she got there, she was crying. She was so sad. But as she came into the garden, she realized that the big stone that had been blocking the cave where Jesus' body had been put was moved away. And she couldn't figure out how this could happen. It would have taken at least a couple of men to move it. So she carefully peered inside the cave, not knowing what she was going to find, 
And you know what she found? Nothing, nothing at all. It was completely empty. No Jesus's body. Yeah, she was shocked. She didn't know what to make of it. She was so shocked, she said, I've got to go tell somebody about this. And she took off. Now, can I have a little running motion with the shoes? Yeah, a bang, bang, bang. Running, running. No, just the, just the women's shoes. Just the women's shoes. It's only Mary who's running at the moment. Mary is running really fast, really fast. She, is, she was running so fast that by the time she got to the house, she was gasping for breath. And she ran into the house and she said to the, the other friends and students who were there, they've taken his body and I don't know where it is. It's gone. The tomb is empty. Well, John and Peter, two of his other close friends, said, I don't know about this. We need to see this for ourselves. And they started running in a race to see which one of them could get to the tomb first. So I need, I need the men's running shoes, running really fast. Come on, come on. Running, 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 running. And Mary, meanwhile, is like, they don't believe me. I don't know why we're running. It's still going to be empty. So she slowly was running after uh, Peter and John. And Peter and John were neck and neck. It was a close race. And then right at the very end, John pulled ahead and ran and got to the tomb first and looked in and said, there's nothing here. And stood there kind of scratching his head. And then Peter came up and he looked in and he said, you're right, there's nothing here. And the two of them went, so Mary got there, and she said, see, I told you there was nothing there. And they just said, oh, no. And, and Mary, now she was crying not only because Jesus was dead, but she was crying because she didn't know what had happened. And so she looked back in the cave. But this time, she had another surprise. And you know what the surprise was? You'll never get it. You do. You know the story. Yes. There were two angels in the tomb. Two angels. Two. Two. And the angels said, why are you crying? Why are you crying? I bet they had pretty dresses on, too, just like yours. <laughs> And, and Mary said, well, they've taken, they've taken my, my, my teacher's body, and I don't know where it went. And so at that point, she, she heard somebody, and she, she turned around, and there was a man there. And you know what? There, she looked, and she said, oh, he must be the gardener. And she said, um... Mr. Gardner, um, I'm, I don't, no, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up the story. The man asked, also asked her why she was crying. And um, he asked her, who are you looking for? And Jesus, and, and Mary cried even harder. She didn't know what to do. And she said to the gardener, did you take the body? Is you, are you the one? And, and the man turned to her and said one thing, one really important thing. He said her name. He said Mary. Can you say Mary? Mary? Mary. But it wasn't the word, it wasn't just Mary, it was that he looked at her and said her name. And as soon as he did that, she knew that the gardener wasn't the gardener. Who was the gardener? It was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, look, it's okay, Mary. And Mary said, teacher, 
And she was really, really happy. And then Jesus said to her, go back to the other disciples and tell them that you have seen me and I'm gonna go and live with God. And so Mary Magdalene turned around and started running again. And this time she was running because she was happy and excited because she realized that, that even though Jesus was dead, it wasn't all over. That God still loved her and she didn't understand the whole thing. Now, I need some running. Maybe, would you like to run? Can everybody get up and run? Come on. I need, we need a little running. It's going to be run. I need running. Running, 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 running. There you go. So I want you to remember now, in case you ever think that the marathon and Easter have nothing to do with each other, there was running happening on the first Easter. And if you want to put the shoes back in the basket, you can go back and there is a awesome craft for you to do where you can make your own resurrection garden and take it home and remember the story. But it doesn't have running shoes in it. two readings from scripture this morning. <laughs> they come from the Reverend Dr. Wilda Gaffney's A Woman's Lectionary for the Whole Church. Uh, and if you'd like to follow along, they're printed in your bulletin, or if you're watching at home, they'll come up on your screen. So our first reading comes from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. Now from this moment, we consider no one according to the flesh. Even though we once knew Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him thus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, everything is new. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to God through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to God, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting that message of reconciliation to us. We are ambassadors for Christ, while God appeals through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. And our second reading comes from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Now it was the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene came early on while it was still dark to the tomb and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter. Does anybody have any sneakers? <laughs> So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Messiah out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple came and went to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple ran ahead of Peter and reached the tomb first. And bending down to see, saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not enter then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up separately in another place. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, went in and saw and believed. Indeed, they did not understand the scripture, that it was necessary for Jesus to rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned once more to their homes. 
Now Mary stood outside, facing the tomb, weeping. As she wept, she bent down to see the tomb. And then she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why do you weep? She said to them, because they have taken my savior and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why do you weep? For whom do you look? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Rather, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Abba and your Abba, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Savior. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Here ends our reading. May we be blessed with wisdom and courage for interpretation. March 15th, 2020 was the first Sunday that we worshiped entirely virtually due to COVID. It was the third Sunday of Lent, and at first I really believed that the health crisis would only last a few weeks. If everything worked out, we'd be back in the sanctuary together for Easter on April 12th. And then as it became apparent that the pandemic would last more than a couple of weeks, I began to say, no worries. Even if we can't get together on Easter, Whenever we are able to worship together in person, we will celebrate the resurrection because it will be glorious to be together again. Well, somehow, two weeks is stretched into two years, but here we are. The weather is warmer, vaccines and boosters have been given and received, and we are tentatively peeking our heads out of our homes and wondering what's next. I wonder about that first Easter. Did Mary tentatively peek her head into the tomb when she first found the stone rolled away? Did the other disciple tentatively peek in? Did Peter or did he just charge right in? And what about Jesus? Did Jesus tentatively peek out of the tomb wondering what comes next? For the past month or so, I've been using the Disney movie Encanto to illustrate a few different points about life and church and Jesus, and I'm not going to stop now. <laughs> <clears throat> In my Messenger article this month, I wrote a, a little bit about a song called Dos Origitas, the Oscar-nominated song from the film. The song is about two caterpillars in love. Quote, navigating together a world that changes and keeps changing. They travel together and they cling to each other, worrying about all of life's shifts and instabilities. Now, the lyrics written by Lin-Manuel Miranda are in Spanish, but I'll use the English translation that I found on the internet so that I don't mangle all of the pronunciation. One of the verses is, Two caterpillars stop the wind while they embrace with feeling. They keep growing, not knowing when to search for some retreat. Times keep changing. They are inseparable, and times keep changing. I, little caterpillars, don't hold on anymore. You must grow apart and return. You'll keep moving forwards. Miracles come. Chrysalises come. You must leave and build your own future. We live in a world that keeps changing, and we're often not comfortable with the changes. We live in a challenging world, and it feels like there are new challenges thrown at us every day. And so we cling to what we're used to. We resist change, but it's 
like we're trying to stop the wind. They keep growing, not knowing when to search for some retreat. In our success-driven society, we're often told that there is no time to stop, that we need to keep going. Retreat isn't rest, it's surrender. Nowadays, it can feel like rest is the enemy of survival. But once the caterpillars are able to stop fighting the wind, when they can let go of one another and let go of what they've always known, that's when the miracles come. Two disoriented caterpillars in two well-wrapped cocoons with new dreams. Now all that's missing is to do what's necessary in a world that keeps changing. Taking down its walls, there comes our miracle. I wonder how disorienting it is when that chrysalis first breaks open. Do the newly formed butterflies tentatively peek out, seeing the world with new eyes and a new understanding? Yeah, you know, I was thinking about sharing a video of a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis, but honestly, it's kind of gross. <laughs> <laughs> I've always had this romantic image in my mind of, I don't know, like the cocoon falling away and the butterfly's wings gracefully unfurling as it takes to the sky and heads out into the sunset. But coming out of that shell isn't easy. One video that I found showed a monarch butterfly, and apparently their chrysalis is turns transparent when they're ready to emerge. So it's really easy to see how difficult it is for them. The retreat space inside may have seemed so warm and comfy, but now suddenly it's too small. Wings and body parts are all mashed together and the butterfly has to struggle to be free, to free its wings and legs and it's covered in this goo that I've learned is apparently meconium. <clears throat> I wonder if there are times when the butterflies just want to stay put. On the day that they are to emerge, is it like waking up in a warm bed on a cold day when we just want to stay where we feel comfortable and safe? And I wonder if it was like that for Jesus. That first Easter morning, did he open his eyes and think, just a few more hours of sleep. The last three years have been so much work. Can't I just retreat and rest? A little while longer. Peter and the other disciple tentatively peek into the tomb and after they find it empty and do a little bit of exploring space the gospel simply says they returned once more to their homes. Everything had changed and everything had changed in ways that they didn't expect. The resurrection was confusing. Emerging from a chrysalis is messy. You know, it sounds so nice when Paul writes, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, everything is new. But honestly, change is hard. And in the midst of change, we so often find ourselves in a fragile state. As the butterfly emerges, it's vulnerable and delicate. As we tentatively peek out, hoping to emerge from a pandemic, we are vulnerable and delicate. When Mary reached out to Jesus, he said to her, do not hold me because I have not yet ascended. I wonder if Jesus was feeling vulnerable and delicate too. Or maybe he was afraid that if he let Mary hold on to him, that she would never be able to let go again. The final verses of Dosar Gita say, I, butterflies, don't hold on anymore. You must grow apart and return. You'll keep moving forwards. There are already miracles, chrysalises breaking open. You must fly. You must find your own future. Isn't, isn't that what Jesus is saying to Mary? Don't hold on. We must grow apart. We, you'll keep moving forward to find your own chrysalis, your own means of transformation. 
our lives, our world, even our church has changed. And it continues to change, and that's a little bit scary. Despite their faith, despite everything that Jesus had tried to tell them, the disciples were afraid. Their friend and their teacher was taken from them and violently tortured and killed. How could they possibly be expected to go on? But despite that pain, through that confusion, in the face of that violence, resurrection came. What seemed like certain death became new life and new possibilities. It was confusing for the disciples at first, and, and maybe it's still confusing for us. What are we supposed to do with all of this change? The truth is, death needs to occur for resurrection to happen. And so as we see the systems around us struggling to survive, systems of oppression and racism and sexism and inequality and fear, we can listen for God's call to let them die. And as we witness long-term traditions and practices, the way we've always done things, as we see that they no longer work, we can let them die. As we witness toxic forms of Christianity proclaim that we are no good in God's eyes or that God's love is only shown through being personally enriched that God doesn't love someone because of who they love or how they express themselves, or that God doesn't call us to feed the hungry, free the oppressed, and care for the sick. Well, we can certainly let those forms of toxic Christianity die. Death needs to happen for resurrection to, to occur. We need resurrection in our lives, in our world, even in our church. And the good news as Paul writes, is that in Christ Jesus, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to God, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. We are ambassadors for Christ while God appeals through us. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. The world is still changing, and we are called to be a part of that change. We are the ones who can live out God's love. We are the ones who can follow Christ's examples. We are the ones who will be lifted up by the Holy Spirit to discover what God is calling us to next. I'm sure that Mary wanted to hold on to Jesus and never let go again. And as the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney writes, having seen his death, what other than the word of the risen Christ could compel her to let go? Jesus knew that Mary couldn't hold him if she were to discover her own call and follow her own path. And so on this first Easter in person in more than two years, even as we tentatively peek out on an uncertain world, we're called to keep moving forward. There are already miracles, surprising wonders, unexpected changes, and we are called to find our path in this changing world. I, butterflies, don't hold on anymore. You must grow apart and return. You'll keep moving forwards. There are already miracles, chrysalises breaking open. You must fly. You must find your own future. May God continue to guide us on our flight. Amen. <laughs>
you please join me now in the prayers of the people? Risen Lord, you know physical pain and loss. You understand our times of despair. Hear now our cry for your help, for those surrounded by the shroud of death, for those suffering illness, visible or veiled, for those weighed down by grief, hear our cry for your healing. For those burdened by worries of war and the world, for those saddened by estrangement and isolation, for those frightened of the future and the changing world, hear our cry for your gift of hope. Living Lord, you know the bond of friendship and the love of family. You illuminate our joys. So hear also our acclamations of thanksgiving for those celebrating new life and birthdays, anniversaries, for those reveling in life-affirming opportunities and adventures, for your provision through deep valleys and mountaintop highs alike, hear our praise. Redeeming Lord, you forgive us even when we do nothing to earn it. You made the move to save us when we were still a fallen world, people trapped in our own cocoons. Hear our words of gratitude for the mercy with which you see us, for the constancy with which you listen, and the model by which we live for the unconditionality with which you love. Hear our prayer of thanks and help us to emerge this day to soar, doing our part to make earth more like your heavenly vision. On Easter and every day since you have transformed, bloomed, and death and changed injustice into life resurrection and renewed. Hear us as we pray together the words taught by your Son, our Father, who art in heaven. So as we continue to emerge from our cocoons, uh, we have a few, few short announcements. We have a few events coming up. Uh, keep an eye out for our um, electronics recycling and document shredding, which is April 30th. Uh, and we have our service auction coming up in May, May 21st, and lots of opportunities to, to help out and to participate in all of the different ways that we are church together. Um, <clears throat> also, for those who still haven't handed in a pledge card, uh, you have until now to do so, uh, maybe tomorrow. If you have a card, feel free to put it in the offering plate as we pass it through, or you can hand it to George Connor, or you can email George, uh, and, and we are going to be 
putting together our final version of the, the budget this week based on, on the pledges that are there to make sure that we put together a, a balanced budget. Um, so far, we have received 53 pledges out of the 80 that we're hoping to receive, and we're at about $216,000 um, towards the $296,000 that we're getting. So thank you to everybody who has already pledged and who is going to be pledging. Uh, in a moment, the ushers will come and uh, pass along the offering plate if you are here in, in the sanctuary. And for those here in the sanctuary and at home, um, there's a QR code either on the screen or on your, um, on your bulletin that you can scan with your phone's camera, and it will take you to our donation page on our website, which gives a couple different uh, ways that you can donate electronically if, if you are able to and choose to do that. Um, what an abundance of gifts we have to offer. Musical talent, the melody of laughter, the use of our hands in cooking and repairs, the use of our minds in problem solving, curiosity, compassion, patience, urgency, spiritual reservoirs, and financial resources. All these gifts and others which bear our personal marks are symbolized in our offering for the work of the church. And so let us commit ourselves in service as we worship God with our
gracious God, we give you thanks for all that you have given us. In return, we humbly offer up our gifts. Send the blessing of your Holy Spirit over everything we receive today and over us. Help us to use our gifts to go out into your world and to do your work, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And I invite you now to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 218, as we once again join our voices together singing, Thine is the glory. been paying attention, no matter how sneaky we try to be, you may have seen Melinda going from the bells to the choir loft, and I go from here to the choir loft, and Mary Jane went from the harp to the organ. Now's your chance to do some running. If you would like to join us in the choir, ho- uh, the choir loft for the Hallelujah Chorus, we invite you to come and join us. Uh, if you'd like to be in sections, the sopranos are in the lower left hand, basses are in the upper left hand, the Tenors are that big empty space in the upper right hand, and the altos are in the lower. So come and join us, uh, and we will sing the Hallelujah Chorus after the benediction. Congratulations, you've all just signed up for the choir. (laughs) In the dark of the early morning, it descended, the very breath of God. Dawn approached, the spirit filled the lungs of our fallen king, and his heart began to beat anew. At the rising of the sun, he awoke. He opened his eyes, he smiled, he rose. Victorious. They say the tomb was empty, 
but we know otherwise. Sorrow and mourning left behind, fear and shame left behind, sin and death left behind, our old ways and our old selves left behind. Forever entombed by Christ, who has conquered the grave, who is risen, who reigns. Hallelujah. May the living God who raised Jesus from the dead bless you and keep you and make you shine with joy. May God raise up new life in you and give you peace for the sake of Jesus, the Lord of life. Christ is risen. Tell the world. Risen indeed. Hallelujah.